Hey, y'all, I'm Ty Herndon, and I was born country. Hey everybody, Arthur Bourne here. Welcome to episode number 19 of the Bourne Country Podcast, where we take a look back at the great country music of the 90s with the artists who were there and the artists of today in which it inspired. This week, we have a chat with 90s country hitmaker Ty Herndon, and we discuss his upcoming concert for Love and Acceptance in Nashville during CMA Fest Week, so make sure to hit the show notes for the episode at IWasBornCountry.com slash show19 for more information on that concert. Before we get to Ty, man, what a weekend I had over the past few days. On Friday night, I had the pleasure of taking in a truly unique John Barry concert at one of my favorite venues, The Listening Room in Port Clinton, Ohio. I don't know what the exact count is, but I'd have to guess that The Listening Room holds no more than 80 people in a very cool, intimate setting. It's almost like your favorite artists are performing a show in your living room. John performed a three-hour acoustic set, and man, did he play everything. After playing most of his hits like Your Love Amazes Me, Kiss Me in the Car, and a handful of others, uh, the show eventually became a by-request show in which John asked everyone what he should play. We heard cover songs of Neil Young and John Denver favorites, some deep cuts from John Barry's albums that he doesn't play that often, and heck, he even performed an a cappella rendition of Oh Holy Night. That's right, Oh Holy Night at the end of April. The Portland, Ohio fans ate it up. It was great to see John, as always, and we were able to speak with him briefly after the show, but I can't wait to catch with him even more down at CMA Fest in June. Also this weekend, I experienced my very first Jody Messina show. I was lucky enough to be invited to meet Jody quickly before the show, and I'll have that photo up with her on the Born Country Twitter and Instagram accounts. Jody's set was awesome, and the sold-out Dusty Armadillo crowd in Rootstown, Ohio loved it. Jody performed all the hits, like Heads Carolina, Tales California, My Give a Damn's Busted, Bring on the Rain, I'm Alright, Bye Bye, everything. She even wrapped the show up with a cover of Journey's Don't Stop Believin'. Uh, the standout moment of the show came with a performance of Bigger Than This, and I wish I could have caught the reaction on video. Simply incredible. Okay, let's get this interview with Ty Herndon underway. Be sure to head over to follow the podcast on Instagram by searching at Born Country Podcast in the app. I'd love to have you. Enjoy the interview. My guest this week on the Born Country Podcast charted a handful of top 10 singles throughout the mid-90s and early 2000s, including three number one hits with What Mattered Most, Living in a Moment, and It Must Be Love, along with many other accolades. Ty Herndon, welcome to the Born Country Podcast. Oh, my friend, we've been trying to do this forever. I'm so excited to finally talk to you. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. We actually talked at a show probably a year ago about doing this. And it's, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's been some time. Absolutely. Now, I want to get into some of the uh, above-mentioned highlights of your career. But first, let's talk about the upcoming Concert for Love and Acceptance. Uh, you've been involved with the show since its inception in 2014. The floor is yours. Tell us all about it. Um, you know, I, I, am, uh, I am so passionate about um, all these amazing kids that are – that are that have so much potential um and when i found out the news that uh, <laughs> that so many so many kids around this country were were losing their lives they were they're, they're committing suicide up to 20 up to 2800 kids a year man i was under 14 and i was just like okay you know i i'm so fortunate i get to play music for a living and i get to uh to travel all over the country and see the, and see the world and it just breaks my heart to think that a kid would be so broken that that they wouldn't have the opportunity to have that kind of life so even if you're you know if, if you're uh, um even if you're selling tvs at walmart I, I would do that for a living if i was happy i don't care so um i started the concert for love and acceptance uh, for all that money to go towards um education and educating adults to um be more aware of what's going on on this planet and that they are loved and, and, and to teach these kids love. And so, and, and to love them no matter what or who they are in this life. It's a really wonderful cause. And you've got a strong lineup for the show this year with uh, CMT's Cody Allen. Uh, our listeners, of course, know Terry Clark, Cassidy Pope, Michael, uh, Michael Ray, and a handful of others. Uh, just a really cool lineup. Thank you, man. This year we've opened it up because if, if um, 
we're kind of crazy. We're doing this event right in the middle of CMA Music Fest. And if any of the big artists play the, the main stage, they're really not allowed to do uh, much else. So okay. we just opened it up to say, hey, just drop by and, and walk on stage and, and, um, and do a song. So we've got some mind-blowing folks that we can't advertise this year that are just going to walk out and, uh, and do a song. So um, I'm glad we did that, but that, that just means a lot of the, 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 uh, the fans are just going to have faith in us that, we are, uh, um, <laughs> that, that we're going to blow their minds. Uh, tickets are still available, so if you'll be in the Nashville area, especially being CMA Fest, uh, make sure to get tickets as soon as possible. I'll sure to have a link in the show notes at IWasBornCountry.com slash show19. Now, Ty, I'd like to jump way back to the very early days of your career. Uh, can you tell me about the Tennessee River Boys? <laughs> I love that I laughed about that. I giggled. <laughs> I didn't laugh. I giggled. I giggled. Uh, the Tennessee River Boys was, gosh... What was that? What was that? Um, 1980, 81, 82. We, uh, we did a show at Opryland USA. If you guys that don't know what I'm talking about, it was a theme park in Nashville. That's now the Opryland hotel, but we did a show, um, for five years and that band eventually became Diamond Rio. And, uh, oh my gosh, I'm still friends with all those guys. Well, I actually, um, ended up doing a show called star search with right. McMahon and, for some of your young listeners, I will tell you this: it's uh, it's kind of the American Idol uh, for the for the '90s, and uh, oh my gosh, so many people: Rosie O'Donnell, Leanne Rhimes, just to name a few. But um, that that kind of launched my solo career, and um, I I, uh, I was the lead singer of the band, and then Marty Rowe from Diamond Rio took my place. Right, and they went on. So we all it was it's a happy ending for everybody. <laughs> Uh, can you share any memories from your time on Star Search and how you think it boosted your attempts at landing a solo career? Well, I became really good friends with Ed, Ed McMahon and his wife. And, you know, um, he's he's deceased now. And uh, he was such a cool guy. And and I got to meet Johnny Carson through through Ed McMahon. And, um, you, you know, he he, um, he was a really special guy. But um, I had also launched a really long time friendship with um, uh, with a lot of people from that show, Sawyer Brown being one, we were on the same year and, you know, oddly enough, we've never toured together, but we've been friends many years. We just, I just, I just talked to them recently and I'm like, guys, you know, with the nineties recurrence, we, we need to go out there and, uh, and do a few casinos. It'd be yeah, kind of fun. That'd be great. Uh, uh, just giving a brief list here. I see, uh, like Billy Dean, Phil, uh, Phil Vassar, James Bonamy, Leon Rhymes, like you said. I bet there's some interesting footage that can be pulled up there. Isn't it interesting that you never see any of that footage? I, I you know, I've tried many times just to, uh, uh, to, to, to email the network just to get the footage. They, they, it seems to be locked away somewhere. So I'm not sure what, it must be some legal thing, but it's so hard to find any of our star search appearances from people that have gone on to be really successful. It's, 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 uh, it's hard to find. I, I, Sam Harris was the winner of the year that I was on the show. Um, I, I, I came in second to him, which was kind of cool because he went on to win three, I think three Tony awards. If I'm not mistaken, Wow. we were talking about this. You, you can't find any of the footage. It's so hard to find yeah. um, uh, from the first year that the years after that, you could, you can, you can find stuff. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So if, if, <laughs> if anyone out there has footage of the first year on a, on a VHS, Go ahead and post it, because we'd love to have it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know it's out there. Somebody's got it. Somebody's got it. They do. So sometime after Star Search, I uh, read that you found yourself down in Dallas, Texas. And this is a point of your career that I'm really curious about, because in the mid-80s, uh, acts like George Strait, Randy Travis, Dwight Yoakam, Ray, uh, Ricky Van Shelton, these guys were all kind of breaking some serious ground. And then in the late 80s, of course, we got Garth, Alan Jackson, Travis Strait, Clint Black, so many others getting major spotlight. At this time... I assume you saw some of these guys coming through Dallas. Uh, what was your mindset like seeing such a surge in country music and all these guys finding their way <laughs> while it'd still be uh, roughly a decade until your first major album would release? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. None, none of us were famous then. None of us had even a record on the radio. So we were just in competition with each other, which was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, I, I, I would, I would like to say that we were all best friends, but we were not because everybody was competing for the same bars. Right. So it was a healthy competition. 
Um, you, you, I just remember, I, I especially remember all of the acts that we were playing the same honky tonks and then, uh, Tracy bird. Oh my gosh. And, uh, you know, he and I played a lot of the same places and we just ended up being friends later on because we all ended up having hit records together. Uh, come 1995, you were releasing your debut album, climbing up the charts and your first single, what mattered most hit number one, uh, with all that work leading up to this point and having a single reaching the top right off the bat, what was that experience like for you? Wow. It blew my mind, to be quite honest with you. I, uh, I've been playing honky tonks for quite a long time in Texas, and I ended up winning Texas Entertainer of the Year, and that launched uh, my career, man. There was somebody in the audience from Sony Records, and they brought me to Nashville, and they signed me for one single and <laughs> they told me if that single did well, that I would uh, get to get to do an entire album. And um, I think we, I think we ended up having a, in 14 weeks, having the first number one country record in the nation. So it was kind of cool. That's so awesome. It blew my mind. Now, I want to stick with your debut album here for a few minutes. Uh, as mentioned, what mattered most hit number one, and it was followed up by one of my absolute favorite Ty Herndon songs. I want my goodbye back. I think ah. w w one of the big selling points on this song for me was the music video. And the video is directed by Steve, uh, Stephen Goldman. And I actually yeah. spoke recently with Michael Peterson a few weeks ago about Steven and how important he oh, was. Oh, you did? That's yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. Uh, we <laughs> talked, we talked about how important, uh, Stephen Goldman was for country music throughout the nineties. And from what I can see, oh, he pretty much directed every one of your music videos. Uh, yeah. Can you give me a, your take on Steven and what it was like working with him? Well, number one, I miss him. Um, what an amazing man. And um, I'm, I'm wearing a T-shirt right now that says cancer sucks. Um, and, you know, he lost his life to cancer. And I right. just, uh, uh, I've lost family members and friends. And I just, it's just, you know, it's sad. But, you know, <laughs> I said this this morning on uh, actually on Fox News that you know I, I'm a I'm a I'm a Christian gay man and I know that I'll see those people again so um, you know uh, Stephen will be producing a video for me in heaven and I love that <laughs> <laughs> but I love that man I, he did such great work for me and Shania Alan Jackson I mean the, and Martina the list Everyone. goes on and on yeah and I'm I'm just super surprised that uh, um, that all of us haven't gotten together because when he died it was just so undercurrent. Um, I, I want to eventually do something here in Nashville just to, just to, um, memorialize him because, um, we do love and acceptance, but you know, we've lost some amazing people behind the scenes in this town and I don't think we recognize them enough. So, um, because I, as an artist today, I, I think about it, we were in such a time, we were almost MTV of country on CMT and the artists today wouldn't be where they are without those videos. And so I think, uh, I think Stephen deserves some, some huge recognition. And I didn't mean to give you that detail of an answer, but well, that's, that's how fine. I feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> a third and final single from your first album was uh, Heart Half Empty. And this was a duet with a gal named Stephanie Bentley. And Stephanie would go on to release a, a number of singles, but she never really got a good footing on the charts as a recording artist. Can you fill me in on Stephanie and how she became involved with the song? Well, I didn't know her at all. And my producer signed her, Doug Johnson, who also signed me to the label along with Paul, Paul Worley. Um, and he just said, man, I want you to do this uh, song with this new artist. And <laughs> quite honestly, I tried so long to get a record deal and I couldn't get one that I said, dude, if she is as amazing as she sounds on this recording, I'm all in. And so I thought that was the number one record. We got all the way up to think, I think the number 10 on the charts with that song, but um, that was the first time I realized that we you couldn't release a single that was any that 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 was over three minutes. <laughs> 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 you got to stick to that three minute mark and under, man. Yeah, yeah. So after your first album, you released a number of really great records over the next few years and plenty of successful singles. But I want to save some of those for a possible return episode down the road. What I would like to discuss okay. is uh, your most recent album, 2016's House on Fire. Looking through the liner notes on the CD, the first thing that really catches my attention is that you co-wrote on seven of the 12 tracks. Uh, prior to this, outside of a very few songs that you recorded, you didn't really write on a lot of songs that often. I have to imagine that this makes House on Fire a bit more personal. 
uh, than some of the previous records? I started writing a little bit later in life. You know, I, I was actually writing when I was in Texas. And during the 90s, the, I think there was very few artists that were writing and recording their songs, Alan Jackson being one of the main ones. It was just it just wasn't um, wasn't something that you did. So I came into the label as a writer, and they were like, "Oh man, you know we got great writers up here at the label. You don't need to do that." <laughs> so <laughs> my writing fire got put out early, and um, uh, in my in my forties, I just I had a lot more to say. So I was like, you know, screw that, man. <laughs> I'm gonna be writing my songs, dude. So, but also recognizing that a lot of young songwriters are coming to this town like I did that just couldn't get a break. So I listened to everything because I think, you know, there may be that shining star of this guy's like, Oh my God, I wish somebody would hear my song. And when you hear that song, you know that that guy's a star. So I, I listened to everything. That's really cool. Uh, the album's really solid and I love the variety of the whole thing. You definitely have country in there with aspects of Dobro, pedal steel, mandolin, there's also a taste of uh, modern country. Uh, how is it balanced out on your end as far as maybe aiming for something that could have a run on the radio while still wanting to keep some of that classic country sound? <laughs> That's a great question. And uh, I hope a lot of people hear this answer. I have finally, and, and I have a lot of friends in radio. I really do. Um, you know, but I finally came to the place where I had my, I had my shining moment with that. And I was chasing that so hard oh my God, this is a radio single. Oh my God. That I was losing the whole concept of music. I was losing the concept of my story and where I'm at today and what my fan base, which is country and LGBT want to hear. And that's my story. It's how I got to where I'm at today and which is a happy, successful and thriving life. And so sometimes that makes it on the radio and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> I kind of let go of that completely. Um, and then um, recently I heard that they, David Lee Murphy with Kenny Chesney on the radio. I said, <laughs> okay, well, okay, well, I, maybe I need to call up some of my buddies that are, that are these new kids on the block on the radio and, and maybe do something. But being on radio is not as important to me today. And here's where we are in the music business. Um, you don't have to be. Man, you can put it. I, as a matter of fact, I'm releasing two albums this year. I'm releasing, I can't tell you what the first one is, but I can tell you what the second one is. I'm releasing a jazz classic album oh, and cool. then the first one is going to, the, the first one is going to blow everybody's minds. But from the, the album, that's the surprise. I'm i uh, I'm doing 10 YouTube full out videos. Um, just to, just to remind people who I'm, who I am as an artist today. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> um, I, I'm not planning on servicing any of it to radio just, and this is just, to set a set an example to artists that are coming to town today. That sounds if cool. You've got great social, if you've got great social media numbers, um, service that. And if it gets big enough, then radio is going to pay attention to that. So as I manage an artist uh, and, and uh, produce artists today, that's um, radios on the back burner. So uh, <laughs> yeah, with, and, and uh, some of my radio friends, yeah, some of my radio friends go, well, that's smart. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, starting to wind down a little bit, let's take a look at a couple of fan submitted questions. Uh, Edward in Pennsylvania. Sure. Edward in Pennsylvania submitted a number of questions, but we're going to choose one here. Uh, he asked, Ty, other than country music, what types of music do you appreciate and which artists do you listen to? Oh, wow. I have, I have a lot of, as far as current artists, uh, I've been fortunate to, to, to meet, you know, and hang out with Carrie Underwood a little bit. I love her as an artist. And uh, to be honest with you, when I came back from L.A., I hadn't made a record in seven years. She had a song called So Small that was out on the radio that I heard, I heard her sing um, in a climate where I wasn't hearing a lot of great singers on the radio. And I was like, damn, this girl can sing. OK, so that, that inspired me to, um, to, to to sing my ass off and start doing some uh some recording again, but uh, you know, Brett Eldridge, um, Brett Young, Mayor and Morris, you know, those are artists that can sing. And I love that because quite honestly, <laughs> I'm going to get probably slapped in the face for this, but I believe if you're going to be on the radio. You should be able to sing. So um, I, I love great singers. So, and as far as 
um, artists of the nineties. I'm, I'm friends with a lot of them today. Winona, Faith Hill, you know, Tim and, um, you know, Terry Clark, just, um, and, and just, just fortunate to have some great friends that, uh, have left a great legacy in country music and are, and are still viable today. They're still out there touring and doing great. All right. The second question, I, I believe this name is pronounced Doty. So Doty is writing from British Columbia up in Canada and wants to know if you have any idea when your book is going to be published. <laughs> well, my story keeps uh, keeps evolving. So uh, my, my book publisher publisher says we're hopefully going to um, maybe do this in three parts. So hopefully the first part will hit the online Kindles by August of this year. So um, that's that's what we're shooting for. Cool. Yeah, I I didn't even know until getting this question sent in that you had been writing a book. And I was curious after getting the question, so I searched your name on Amazon, and I found an author also named Ty Herndon who wrote a book titled How to Live in a Van and Save Money, which is 66 pages long. (laughs) Well, that's not me. Thanks, by the grace of God, it's not me. But, you know, it could be me tomorrow, so I get it. All right, our final fan question comes from Anthony in Mississippi. Uh, Ty, if you were to record a duets album, who would be your first chosen duet partner for the project? I would have three. It would be uh, th- three of my girlfriends. It would be um, it would definitely be Terry Clark, Shelley Wright, and it would be a far reach, but I- I'd have to rope her in. Um, my my favorite female singer on the planet is Carrie Underwood, ah. uh, along with mi- along with millions of others, but. You know, I've also gotten to be really good friends with Michael Ray and Brett Young. And, um, you know, I have to throw a, I throw a few guys on there as well. So um, it would be uh, it'd be really hard for me to answer that question if I did a whole duets album. Um, I'd probably have to stick with my sister, Shelly Wright. Sounds good. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to try something new here, uh, a bonus round of sorts. I'm going to throw a few fellow country artist names at you and maybe give me your brief thoughts or a quick story, whatever comes to mind. Uh, let's start with okay. uh, Joe Diffie. <laughs> Joe and I were on the same record label, and he'd had a few country singles prior to me. But right when my first single came out, I think that his first single was, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, don't quote me, I think it was Prop Me Up against the jukebox. And, uh, we used to hang out at the label together, and uh, we never toured. But I love Joe Diffie; he's a he's a good man. Let's do uh, Sammy Kershaw. Uh, I did six shows with Sammy Kershaw on the road, and I, I was I pulled up in my tour bus, and Sammy was in his Winnebago, and he had me uh, uh, come on his Winnebago. We had a at the time I I, I was uh, I was drinking beer. I don't drink anymore. But at the time we had a had a beer together and hung out and uh, did some shows together and. Recently, on the 50th anniversary uh, anniversary of the CMA Awards, he sat right behind me, and um, we got to reminisce about uh, about the 90s and uh, the state of country music. That's awesome. Sammy seems like a cool guy. Let's move on to Anita Cochran. I know you've got something here. I don't know her at all. <laughs> <laughs> She's my sister from another mister. Um uh, you know, we've been, we, she's my best friend, actually. Uh, one of the greatest female guitar players, bass player, oh my God, singer, songwriter. And recently, you know, she's a cancer survivor and we've just been through a lot together. So she has um, a big piece of my heart. And I think she's one of the most underrated female country artists in this genre. They, they should have paid a lot more attention to her. And, um, I told her just yesterday, I said, you know, there's a reason you survived this cancer because I believe you're going to go write this amazing album and a lot of people are going to know who you are. So there you go. Yeah. Actually, uh, last year was the first time I got to see you perform and Anita was with you and it was so cool to see both of you up there on the stage and I'd never seen either of you before. So it was a really cool experience to see that chemistry on stage together. (laughs) Oh, thank you, man. Thank you so much. You know, we, we are both very, Anita and I are both very positive people. You know, we believe that we are exactly where we are on this planet today because we are, um, we are supposed to, to be out there changing hearts and minds and uh, making a difference on this planet with positivity and love. So we, that's why we're friends. All right. One final name here. 
Let's talk about Shania Twain. <laughs> Whose bed have your boots been under? <laughs> I think that song was out. I think that song cost me a number one record, actually. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think my song uh, "Need to Be Loved Too Much" was it sat at number two for like four weeks because that song sat at number one for sixteen weeks. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I love Shania. She's she's a she's a sweet girl. I love, uh, you know she's uh, she joins the rank of many of us who enjoyed. Uh, well, I didn't enjoy the succession I had, but I enjoyed. Um, the fan base and that's uh, uh she and i've talked about that before we just were so lucky to have such an amazing fan base in country music all right ty where can everyone find you on social media it's so easy ty herndon uh ty herndon official on instagram uh and just just me i like to tell i always tell the fans just type my name in and on any of the socials and uh, and look for the blue check mark if the blue check mark is not there, and if you ever hear from anybody and doesn't have that, then you know they're a creep. So don't 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 engage. <laughs> yeah, that blue check mark is so, so important. Blood. It is. Yeah. Yes. And what I have to say to those people who who fake being someone else, get a damn lie, Lord Jesus. <laughs> 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 and, it, 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 you know, you, I think a lot of the fans will agree with that because it's annoying. So, but we won't end on that note because that's negativity. Right. What we, what we will end on is this. I am such a fan of country music and so many guys like yourself are just doing incredible um, features out there, you know, w- with your websites and, and your blogs and um, keep up the good work, my friends. Hey man, I appreciate it. Uh, Ty, thank you so much for joining me on the Born Country podcast this week. I'll catch you down in Nashville during CMA Fest. I look forward to it, my friend. God bless. All right. Take care, Ty. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Ty Herndon for taking the time to join me on the show this week. I can't wait to hear those new albums coming out later this year. As always, I can't tell you guys how important it is for you to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. Even more important, please, please leave reviews. Booking guests on the podcast highly relies on listener interaction. I can't stress enough that without you folks tuning in each week, this show wouldn't be possible. If you enjoy the show and get any entertainment out of it, please help to support and keep it alive. Once again, make sure to head over to IWasBornCountry.com slash show19, where I'll have all of Ty's social media accounts linked up, along with info about the concert for love and acceptance in June. Thank you to everyone out there listening to the podcast this week. Not sure what we have lined up for episode 20 yet, but certainly stay tuned to the Born Country Podcast social media accounts to keep yourself informed. My name is Arthur Bourne, and I was Born Country. Talk with you soon. Mm-hmm.